Hey, how's it going? Good, how are you? I'm all right. Good. Yeah, it's going all right. <laughs> yeah. Well, thanks for taking the time and chatting with me today. I appreciate yeah, no worries. It. Um, I have a bunch of questions and hopefully we can get them done in the next 40 minutes before Zoom okay. gets us out, but um, <laughs> uh, I guess we can get right into it. Um, I was hoping we could start at the beginning. I know you were born and raised here in the Sioux, um, so I want to start with what it was like living in Sioux St. Marie for you, like whereabouts did you live, elementary <clears> school <throat> you go to, um, what did you do in your free time, all that. All that. Mm. Yeah, stuff I haven't thought about uh, a whole lot. Um, yeah, I grew up on Wellington Street, uh, I guess, in the central part of town. I went to Alex Muir uh, Public School, which is no longer. Um, I think it's a bunch of houses now. Um, yeah, I don't know. Like, when I was a kid, I wasn't really that into music. Um, you know, I was into hockey, like, every, you know, <laughs> boy born in Northern Ontario. Um, music didn't really come until like the end of elementary school when I started playing guitar and sort of getting interested in bands and like, um, you know, I didn't even think it was like something I, I didn't think, I didn't, I still barely think too far ahead with anything, but, um, it was just something that was fun. Right. Um, and then I went to high school, uh, at the Dunn and I'd say like, I was still just sort of casually into guitar. And then I think at a certain point, um, at least my tastes in like music sort of changed to from like typical sort of like adolescent, like, um, you know, at the time, like Blink-182 and bands like that were really popular and my tastes like got more refined. Um, and I started to sort of discover, you know, Bob Dylan and, other sort of more, yeah, maybe just like maybe more literate bands like Wilco and um, the Weaker Thans were a big pivot band for me where they had, you know, sort of those like, it was a rock band and they had like big guitars, but they, you know, John K. Sampson is like a incredible lyricist and I, there's something deeper going on other than, you know, in, in contrast to other things that I was listening to at that time. And then I was like, I got really into songs. That was probably the biggest sort of change for me and sort of less about, can I play this guitar thing like technically well? I was just more interested in like what people had to say and how those songs were put together. And that sort of co, you know, aligned with, um, you know, Mark Goff really took an interest in me. Um, he was my guitar teacher at the time. And then um, the Dunn sort of, ended up having a recording program <clears throat> and uh yeah that's sort of like I don't know that's sort of the two-minute version of how I got into music awesome. <laughs> yeah um so what was that opportunity like at the Dunn and what did that experience like really propel you to do well so like I I I mean one, I got like free recording time. So when they, Mark had always been like recording local bands at his house. He he sort of turned his house into a studio for years. Um, and I'm pretty sure he recorded like done plugged like albums were not a thing when I went there. That was long gone. And Mark really had wasn't involved in done plugged by the time I got to school but he basically at a certain point he moved his recording studio to the Dunn and created a recording program and this sort of co you know coincided with my first sort of chunk of songs I ever wrote mm -hmm. I was probably like 19 years old um and Mark was like basically just offered for me to be like the guinea pig to make sure everything worked <laughs> and so <laughs> Um, I got to record my first record. Mark played drums on it. Um, Frank Dresty played bass on it. And then me and my, my friend Rory, Rory played guitar. And then it was my songs and we, yeah, I sang them. I was like, I had no idea how to make a record or anything. The, so that first record, which um, you can't really find anywhere anymore, but I think there was probably some like glimmers that like I could put together a song um, and had like some sort of affinity to doing that. And Mark really like helped me like 
understand what being in the studio was like and what it took, even though I was incredibly naive and I was just like, okay, sure. I'll play mm -hmm. guitar to this, you know, like, but, um, you know, like at that point I was pretty set, like, okay, this is what I'm going to do. Um, I went to, I ended up moving to Ottawa and went to Carleton for classical guitar. Um, so I have a degree in that. And then, but the whole time, like that, put out that first record when I was in first year university. And then I think I put out my second record by fourth year university. And at that point, you know, I was already sort of off and running. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> no, that got through many of my questions with that. That's awesome. Okay, um, good. <laughs> so what was there a moment that it just like clicked that you just knew you could take off with this or did it kind of come at you um, at that no. point? No. Yeah. There's never like one set thing. I mean, like I started playing shows really young and really early and a lot. Um, if people were sort of, I don't know if, I don't know your sort of history with the Sioux and like the Sioux music scene, but I, I had sort of a lot of like people that sort of nurtured my career really, really young. And I like, I played a lot of shows and got a lot of reps, <laughs> um, when I was like, you know, 18, 19 years old, because I just opened for like every band that came in to the Sioux and there was stuff that was going on. Like Lop Lops was really thriving at the time. And there's lots of really like good, important Canadian, let's just throw like indie music as like the umbrella. Yeah. Um, but a lot of those bands, like this is when like Canadian indie music was really booming, right? You know, this is like the height of CBC radio two and three and um, when streaming hadn't hit yet, um, and, and press was really vital and important in, fi in defining and discovering new music. And I had all these people that were like, oh, well, like, we'll get Kaled open. And, and I ended up opening for so many really, really good bands. You know, I ended up just like off the top of my head, like, you know, the Wooden Sky ended up being a really big band that I opened up for a lot across a bunch of tours. Gavin produced um, one of my really big records or, you know, big for me, um, my most successful record. Um, I opened for Blue Rodeo at the, at the, whatever the hockey arena was called at the time. Um, there was like lots of those things where like people really helped me develop. And I was also given like, all the perfect scenarios to develop that young, um, you know, where I was able to play like once a month, opening for someone good and creating those contacts. And also like, you know, Mark really, really helping me at the time, um, you know, getting recording off the, off the ground. And then I had this like sort of dumb, naive like fearlessness that like cool like i'm just gonna do this so i booked you know my first tour at like 19 when two of us in the band weren't old enough to play in in venues that we were playing in <laughs> like i remember we we played the horseshoe and like two two out of the four of us weren't old enough to be in the horseshoe and they were like can we see your ids and we're like uh <laughs> and like you know it was just like, no, I'm just going to do this. And uh, my friends are going to do it with me. And there wasn't like one moment that this was like, oh, this will be a career. It was like, it just turned out to be where by the time my second record was recorded, which is a record called Anchors that Mark also, um, he produced and, and tracked. Uh, that was done at the Dunn as well. Um, I had like, this is also the time when YouTube started to like become a thing. And I had a viral music video when that, when those things like really mattered um, for a song called Thickest Thieves that my friend, Kevin Perry, uh, who's also from the Sioux is now like a really successful um, influencer, I guess you'd call oh, him. Awesome. Yeah. He's like, I mean, he's like, he's literally a genius. Um, and so he made a stop motion music video for a song called Thickest Thieves. It was a stop motion history of the world. And it went crazy. And I remember being in fourth year at Carleton and I was just like, yeah, like I'm already doing the thing that you're trying to like 
right. hopefully get people to do. So I'm just like not really going to come much anymore. Um, and then I like I don't I hadn't worked another normal job right in my entire life uh, uh, like since <laughs> until now where I now teach at Carleton <laughs> I right. teach Full circle. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a professor there so I teach songwriting and I teach you know all involved with singer songwriters yeah. um, but that's like the first adult job I've had since and um, you know if I really think of this is funny. I haven't thought about this stuff in like any sort of meaningful way, but I, a lot of people like Frank Doresti and Mark Goff and, and there was also a coffee shop called Arcadia that was on Queen street. I played there a lot. And that was like a weird, cool, like venue that bands way too, like really big bands played in that place. And it held like maybe 50 people right. um, and stuff like that, that was happening. There was just like, I'm not sure if it, maybe it is still this way there. I don't know. I've, you know, I don't spend a lot of time in the suit anymore, but um, a lot of stuff sort of coalesced to allow me to become who I was, but also like, I, yeah, like I was just like nuts and was just like, cool. Like, I'm just going to do this. Um, and really didn't think much about anything else for a very long time. I love it. That's beautiful. I find that I, talking to people from the Sioux, they have similar stories that the living up here in the North, there's just so much more community and people willing to help support and build that up. Like same with hockey players, because we have so many great hockey players that come out of the Sioux and, and it's the coaching and that, that deep rooted community that helps. Um, so that's really, I, I, th I definitely think that's somewhat true. Mm -hmm. I'm, I would not say that's like, the whole truth. I think right. the I think the other caveat in that is that you need um, sort of like blind ambition to leave the Sioux because you will never, Definitely. you know, Definitely. Um, you could you can't do you can't be a uh, you know what um, I did for a long time or you could. It's just very very hard to do it in a city like Sault Ste. Marie. Um, but at the time for me, you know, at that age at that part in sort of my career and my development, it was yep. integral. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I want to go back to touring. Um, mm. first I want to know when was your first time touring and okay. how far away have you performed from home? Um, so my first tour, I think was right after that first record came out. Um, so that would have been like 2000 and I think my first tour probably was like, in 2010, um, I booked, I want to say like six shows in Ontario, um, had never been to any of these cities before, just sort of was like, cool. And this is like when you can find, you just emailed people, a cold call to email people. I remember being like really nuts about, um, at the time too, in like the music industry, in the Canadian music industry, the like blogs were very influential. Like people legitimately mm -hmm. read blogs and sought them out. And, and I did that a lot with my first couple of records. I was sort of my own publicist for, for yeah. quite a while. And I ended up getting enough press that I could, you know, cold call the horseshoe or something in Toronto and be like, hey, like, can we play? And they're like, cool, you can play on the Tuesday night, whatever. Um, because I had, I guess, you know, a little, I guess some, some forethought or whatever to be like, cool, like I'm gonna get press which means like, hopefully they'll say nice things about my record. Yeah. And then I'll be able to book shows elsewhere because these people said nice things about my record. Sure. And at the time, like I said, YouTube and streaming wasn't a thing yet. So you could, honestly, when I look back at it and how many shows I played and it was like endless, I, um, you, it felt like you were going door to door to people. Like, mm -hmm. <laughs> it was almost like, cool, like we're going to play here and we're going to have five people at it. And then the next time, hopefully there'll be 15. Um, and like we, I, no one made any money, like none for a very long time. And it was like, cool. We get to just like go see the country. You know, I remember we booked uh, our first East coast tour and like we would tour, we would play shows during the school year. we like, while I was in university and then, like all of May, we'd tour somewhere, <laughs> uh, right when school was done. And so, yeah, like there was sort of, that was it. But then, you know, as I 
you know, as things got bigger and became more successful, I toured pretty much everywhere. I mean, I don't know what the furthest place would be in Europe. I toured Europe a lot for, for many years, I guess like Austria, Italy, cool. a lot of, a lot of Germany, you know, Switzerland, and Belgium, and then U S U S stuff, but yeah. Okay. What's the, yeah. what's the major difference between Canadian, American, European, like when you're performing, do you notice a difference in your audiences? Oh yeah. Um, yeah. I probably sold more tickets in Europe than I did in Canada. Um, I mean, hospitality is the different is the biggest difference. Um, Europeans treat artists like people. Um, in America, you're sort of lesser than. Like, it is incredible. I mean, just to tour the states is incredibly expensive for a Canadian musician. You need to get visas, and that costs thousands of dollars to go tour the states where you're going to lose thousands of more dollars. Like, it never the economics of that never made much sense. Um, Canada is really difficult country to tour in. I mean, I've, I don't know, I don't know, like 30 times across this country in my lifetime. Like the problem with touring Canada as opposed to Europe and the States is that every drive is like eight hours, Yes. like basically. Um, and when you're 21, you don't care in the slightest, but I'll tell you once you get a bit older, and like you're still driving eight hours to go play, I don't know, like Lethbridge on a Wednesday night, you're like, why am I doing this? Yeah. Um, and not to say that there's not very good shows in there. There are, you go all the way out there to have a good show in Vancouver and a good show in Calgary and Edmonton. But the reality is, is you can't drive all the way to Vancouver and not play golden British Columbia or something because you have to there's no like so Canada is really hard to tour just just like the sheer size of it and the lack of people I mean the states you can drive four hours and play to a city bigger than Calgary yeah. you know and the same thing in Europe where you know we one year I did like five tours of Europe in one year um and just different chunks, but like, it wasn't, obviously you're flying there, but you know, you'd stick it to stick to a pocket of like Germany, Switzerland, and Belgium. And then the next time you'd go do Austria and go down to Italy. Like yeah. there is, there's other sort of, it's just easier. Wow. And they, and the food is better. Yeah. <laughs> of course. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. Um, and what's it like, I guess, touring as a with other bands or versus touring on your own? Uh, money. Uh, I mean, at a certain point, like you start like there's when you have when you're a solo singer songwriter and it's your name yep. and regardless of how there's collaborators or. Um, you know, people sort of invested in you and like the idea of this thing working, um, it becomes messy and you know that's like i probably didn't do a great job of that for for a long time and then at a certain point it's a lot easier just to treat everyone as if they're like a contract mm -hmm. you know a hired gun but then that places more pressure on me because i'm everything in this scenario i'm you know i'm the boss i'm the bank um i'm also you know the front person and i'm writing the songs and then i'm also the conduit to like the 15 other people that are working for me as well, managers, agents, labels, blah, blah, blah. So um, I don't know where I'm rambling with this, but <laughs> yeah, like that stuff, I mean, touring with other bands is always cool. I mean, like, you know, I've like opened for a bunch of people and sometimes those situations are good and sometimes they're terrible. Um, like, yeah, I, I mean, I'm trying to think, one of the best like touring sort of tours that I ever did was I, I opened, I did the vinyl cafe for mm. about a week and um, which is a really interesting show to do. The vinyl cafe is like, I don't know for the people that don't know is like a really big CBC radio program. It was probably the biggest CBC radio program for like 20 years and they would go do live performances um, and tour the tour that I did was throughout Ontario. It was my first time that I was on a bus, touring on a bus, which was really cool. And it's very like comfortable, but it's also a very odd show to do because you play a song 
And then Stuart McLean, the host of the show, would tell a story for 30 minutes or uh, interact with the audience. And you'd come back out and you'd play another song. Like, <laughs> it, was, it wasn't like your show by any means. Right. But that was, like, a really fun experience and got to play, like, beautiful old theaters to thousands of people. Yeah. Um, so that was great. I mean, but, yeah, I mean, I've opened for a lot of really big people. Like, I'm just, you know, someone like... Um, Charlotte Cardin, who's like totally blown up in the past few years. Like I opened for her at Montreal Jazz Festival. Um, I opened, I opened for Hozier, um, the Take Me to Church guy. He, his yeah. first ever show in Toronto. Wow. That was yeah, that was cool. He's really tall. He's a nice guy. <laughs> um, he had like a he had a full on bus and like crew to play the Rivoli, which is like a hundred and fifty cap room. <laughs> which, if you know the economics of touring, that is insane. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, lots of people, like, lots of really, really big bands, the Arkells. I'm trying to, like, I don't know. I don't have a running list in my head. But, <laughs> um, yeah, like, all those experiences were were great. And a lot of those people I'm still friends with. And it's funny, a lot of those bands that I was telling you, like, The Wooden Sky or Cuff the Duke or, like, Elliot Brood and those bands that came through the Sioux that I got, to op- I got to open for when I was, like, 19 ended up taking me on tour at some other point as well. Um, and you know, we became friends and like, yeah, all really good things that ended up leading to other things down the road. Um, yeah. Cool. Uh, so now I want to jump back to music videos, I guess. Um, okay. Uh, as a storyteller, I'm interested to know what a music video means to you and in your translation from your songs to a visual representation. Not much. Uh, I don't like I guess I've been involved with a bunch of my videos in some capacity um to me they're always just like promotional vehicles um you know the videos that Kevin did for me that did really well those were all sort of like his creations and um now like Avalanche which was like my biggest music video and you know got nominated for a lot of awards and was successful. That was a concept um, my manager had, and then we sort of worked on together. And then we brought in a director and like a huge crew to do that video. Um, But that's the, that, that video is not really connected with the story of the song in any way. It's just a, another example of like viral sort of music videos that I've had a handful of, Mm -hmm. but like, yeah, I don't, my songs, my songwriting has evolved a lot that like I'd say that I, when I was a bit younger, it'd be very hard to do literal like visual storytelling of what the song is saying. Mm-hmm. And now it's sort of, at least like in this newest project that I've been working on called Summer Sets, um, which is very narrative driven songwriting and characters and um, set in a place. Um, those things are possible, but you almost want to like veer the other way and you don't want it to have like feel like musical theater or something where the song is literally, um, you know, a script almost to the music video. So yeah, hopefully that answers it, but not really. Definitely. (laughs) It's just. (laughs) Cause I was curious because when I watch music videos, I tend to like not like watching music videos because it changes my perspective of the song and how I interpret it and stuff. So I just, I thought that was an interesting question. And I liked your yeah for someone for someone who's had a lot of like success with music videos yeah. I don't watch I don't watch them either <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah I could care less yeah um, but in your mu- the music video Avalanche you um, went through different artists and it's I read somewhere that they have an influence in your music journey and they were albums that you listened to growing up and were heavily influenced yeah yeah so that. <clears throat> that music video for avalanche was actually like the original idea was um there's a there was a jay-z commercial where he sort of walked through a bunch of different sets um that were all his album covers Mm. and so the idea for avalanche was that we're gonna like i can't remember how many covers we got through but basically the most famous album covers of all time um basically insert me going through all of them and in concept cool that sounds like a cool concept but like it could it could have gone very badly if we didn't pull it (laughs) off like it could have been the lamest thing in the world and it wasn't um thankfully but 
Um, sorry, what was the, yeah, where was I going with this? Yeah, the, that, the, all those records that were, a bunch of them were just like good album covers. Right. Um, but also like a lot of those records are my favorite records of all time, right? Like yeah. Blonde on Blonde, Born to Run. Uh, geez, there's tons in there. They're all good. Um, but they're all like the classics. Like I'd say they're all, they sort of veer sort of classic, right? you know, top 100 Rolling Stones, top 100 albums of all time type stuff. Um, yeah. Yeah, I love. Um, I kind of want to talk about um, your hotline bling. So I know that. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know, just thought it would be interesting because in the same year that you won um, the awards, uh, the award, the Prism Prize Award for that music video, Drake Hotline Bling was also nominated. And then oh, yeah? the same year you were you chose to cover that song. So I just thought that was interesting. Um, I'd love to know why you chose to release that cover and like what the outcome of that release was. Um, I didn't really choose it. My manager and label were like, hey, you should do this. This song is going to be huge. This was also a time where like you could release a cover of like what is going to be a very big, enormous song and put it out within like two days of that song. And then you can sort of like drift off the back of that, which is exactly what that song did. I remember they were like, hey, you should cover this song. I figured out like my own version of it. Like I got rid of like Drake's like rap verse. That's like, honestly the worst part of that song. It's not like, I think, I think like, especially now, like looking back on it, it was a great decision. Cause it's like, it's just icky sort of gross Drake misogynistic stuff. And then sort of really leaned into like the sad part of that song, yeah. which it is. Um, I remember I like figured it out in like 15, 20 minutes. And then I recorded it in about an hour, at least my part. And then my producer Colin sort of added some of the programming on it. And then we like just threw it up on SoundCloud and I don't know, it's got, I think it has something over like 10 million plays across SoundCloud and Spotify and Apple or something wow. silly. Um, the results of that, I don't know. It's like, it ends up being my number one most played <laughs> song on Spotify. I think that's like, I made money off of it. Like, yeah. I think like, and it always comes up on like CBC's like best Canadian covers of all time and stuff, oh. which is funny. That's awesome. um, yeah, I find that part pretty funny. And like, you know, that's a cool thing, I guess. I mean, like, I think I did a good job at it. Um, but I would not say that like, I ever think about that or I ever perform it. It's just like, it was like another thing like viral music videos. It's like, okay, like how can we like grab people's attention and yeah. sort of hopefully create new fans that therefore means they go listen to my actual records. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Uh, okay. Let's talk about summer sets. Okay. Yeah. New duo. Um, yep. Hey buddy. So how long have you two been friends and known each other and why now did you join forces to create Somersets? So Andrew Soka, who's the other half of Somersets with me, also from Sault Ste. Marie. Andrew's played in my band probably since like 2013. Um, played bass in my band for a long time. He's been on a bunch of my records. Um, <clears throat> The whole Somersets project started with a song I wrote called Never Love Another, which is, um, I had this idea for a song for a long time that I wanted to write a song that told the story of a relationship uh, from the moment two people meet until one of them passes away. So a song that spans decades worth of time, big life events, how can I fit that all into a song? It was more like a challenge to myself to see if I could do it. And I wrote it and then it, I, I'm still incredibly proud of it. I think it's the best thing I've ever done still. And I had never really written that sort of narrative character based songs before um, in that sort of literal style where this is fiction. You know, that song, there's um, a mar um, you know, a wedding and a kid. I'm not married, I don't have a kid, I'm not dead. Um, all those things happen and like, I'm making people up out of thin air. Um, and so that's the song that started it all. And I, at this point, you know, had released um, 
record called Someday the Moon Will Be Gold. That was really, you know, that was my big record in terms of press notoriety. It was nominated for the Polaris Prize. Avalanche comes out. That I that's a record that did very well on radio, nominated for the Juno and all you know, Prism Prize, blah, blah, blah. Um, and then I put out a record called Youth, which was like I really spent a long time making this record. I, you know, a lot of people were invested in that record being a big thing and sort of taking their real next step. And it just never really happened. It was like, it came out, it was very well reviewed and, but I felt like I lost a lot of the momentum I had built up. And I was like, I want to try something else. I don't want to be Kale Matson, the only guys up on stage and have all this pressure and on me. Yeah. And so Andrew felt like, you know, he's a great singer and he's a really good collaborator just as like a person. And I was like, I wrote Never Love Another. And I was like, I think I can keep writing about these two characters and see where this goes. And then it became this, I sort of backed myself into a corner that I was going to make a whole record about this. And um, it ended up, we ended up writing and releasing 20 songs. We put out our first record about a month ago. Um, so the record tells that story of that relationship from the beginning to the end across 16 songs, which feels like a lot, but it's under an hour of music. Yeah. Um, and like, we just really leaned into a lot of the music we like and had no, no one telling us that we needed a song for the radio or a song for a music video right. or that we needed to do a Drake cover or <laughs> that, um, you know, we need, an, we need a big hit for streaming or anything like that. What we did was just like, cool, like, we're really big fans of Paul Simon's music and we're really big fans of Tom Petty and we're really big fans of Gillian Welch. And like, that's the music we listen to and just want to make. So we just, it, it was made under like the purest of artistic intentions. Like we're just going to make this cause we want to make it and truly don't care if anyone listens to it or not. And the funny thing is, is that the way the music industry has evolved, especially in my time, you know, being in it is that, that type of thinking has become even more and more sort of more importance has been placed on it. Something that is authentic and um, true. And like, it's funny for a record that, you know, we've, we're going to play our first handful of shows coming up in four weeks or so. I'm not sure we're going to play many more. Uh, we have a record that we've only released online so far and like, it's pretty, it's done really well. Yeah. Um, for something that like did not have the same infrastructure and sort of like heft making a go as plenty of my other records. And I think that's, it's been really fun and, and um, a different change of pace for me because for a long time, you know, when, when you become more and more successful and I say this with a caveat that like, I, I do think it is success for someone like me to live off of their art for a decade plus i think for anyone any artist would see that as success i always think i've like i've had successes but never been successful mm -hmm. um and something like summer sets you totally just get out of that and you're like cool i'm starting something new and if it works it works if it doesn't it doesn't right. i don't care because i like it and it all of this sort of coincided with you know now um teaching songwriting at a university which is a weird unique thing but like the Somerset's record is like, it was purely about songwriting and really challenging myself to write in this really different way and see if I could pull this record off to, can you tell a story of a relationship across 16 songs and have it like every song be unique right. and switch and switch perspectives, switch genders, switch ages. You know, at the beginning of this record, they're like 16 or 17 in my head. And then at the end they're, 80 you know how do i tell that story and then i guess like if we want to draw it full circle like i set the whole thing in my head in sue saint marie um there's like a bunch of sue like references in there street names and whatnot and like it's all a bit of an amalgamation of growing up there and so the record's called small town story and you know that seems a little obvious but um yeah, the Sioux played like, it was like a sense of place. You know, there's a song called Borderline and it's set looking at the Michigan border. Um, and all those sort of memories of growing up in the Sioux came back and sort of in these two fictional characters.
Yeah, that's beautiful. I was yeah. going to ask about the why you really chose Sault Ste. Marie and why that was like a perfect setting for this. Like, is it is it the border? Is it the where you grow up? Is it like, yeah. I think it's, yeah, you just like, you know, you can never leave. Um, and it's just those like really formative memories of like, you know, the record starts at a house party and there's a car crash and like, um, and you know, there's lots of stuff. There's there's a song called Acceptance Letter that is about an acceptance letter to go to way to school, while the song also being um, an acceptance letter. <laughs> um, it's a little meta, but uh, <laughs> you know, there's like, I, I sort of in creating really a whole lot of fiction had to sort of ground it in you know actual reality a lot for me to be able to feel like these two characters are like real um and give them some depth yeah. um yeah which i think is probably true of any writer i've just never really done it before like this mm -hmm. how long did it take to write a small town story and kind of that process i know it was i feel like it was long right through the pandemic <clears throat> yeah so like i said i wrote never love another and i think i wrote um anywhere you go and those were sort of the first two and I believe I wrote them the very end of 2019 okay. and then I believe the first how it was going to work was um we were going to put out the first single anywhere you go we're, we're going to put that out the, the week that COVID hit um I was in Banff doing a songwriting residency at the Banff Center and COVID hit and we canceled that. And so how this record sort of got written and released was we did it in like two EPs. So there was a first EP called Small Town Saturday, which had Never Live Another on it and five other songs. That came out in August of that year. And then basically I was like writing the record as I went and we put out another EP the year later called Small Town Sunday. Mm -hmm sort of the before and after each half of the record. And then it took me a, a long time by the end to like fill the gaps of, mm -hmm. I had at a certain point, I was like, oh, this is gonna be a record, but I didn't know how big of a story could it could be if it was gonna be like 10 songs or 12 or 20. Right. And um, I just kept writing. And then at a certain point I had enough like I knew how I was going to start in the middle and the end, but then the other songs in, in between those became really hard to write. And I had been storyboarding the record like, okay, track four, like this needs to happen because track six, this happens. And so writing in that way became way harder than I thought because on one hand, you're trying to figure out the lyrics and how, because you know the order that the songs are going to go in beforehand, where a lot of people that make records have no clue the track list that they're going to, they just record 10 songs and they put it in some order and that's your record. This was like, no, I know how this, you know, there's only way, one way this is all going to go. So by the end, I have like four or five holes, but like, I know it has to happen yeah. in terms of plot and character, but I have to write the lyrics to fit those things. And then the other sort of like 3D chess angle is that like it has to work musically and we can't have like three really sleepy songs in a row or like songs in the same key or, you know, just similar-ish songs, not back to back. So you're sort of like, like I was like, I wrote myself into a corner in a lot of ways. And I, and like, I remember telling people this is what I was doing and they're like, oh, good luck with that. <laughs> and I, and so it took a long time probably start to finish i guess we're, we were looking at like three years mm -hmm. um the record has been done since i guess like a year ago at least in terms of my end being done recorded but it took a long time and a lot of planning it was a, it was a lot of planning right. and a lot of um editing it was just on a pure songwriting level very hard and then musically we recorded sort of a couple songs at a time like it was never like a condensed period of recording which is very different to how i've made other records right so 
Yeah, it's it was a weird experience. It was different. I'm not sure I want to do it again. Um, <laughs> but I'm really proud of it. I, I seriously like for someone who's released, I don't know how many records I've released in my life now, but I genuinely think it's the strongest thing I've put out in terms of a pure songwriting and musical level. Um, and I think it goes back to like what I was saying. It had the purest, uh, you know, most authentic of intentions from the beginning. And I think that shines through on it. Definitely. I think so. Um, and it's already, it's only been out for about a month. Not yeah, a about a month. Yeah. And I saw that it's already on Love Island. They had it on Love yeah. songs on Love Island. That's pretty cool. How does something yeah. like that even happen? Um, do they reach out to you? Do you reach out to them? Yeah, not personally. It's like my publisher right. sort of handles that. But I believe what the story is, is that the the woman who's the music programmer for Love Island is just a fan. That's awesome. <laughs> and then, yeah, it's great. I mean, I've had lots of syncs in my life. Um, Love Island's like, honestly, probably the biggest show I've been on, maybe. I'm trying to think. Like, I've been on Degrassi a bunch, but Love Island's for sure bigger than Degrassi. Um, yeah, it's always funny to me how they use yeah you know songs and clips in weird ways but it's great i mean like yeah yeah um it's always a thrill <laughs> when stuff like that happens it's, it's funny you can watch tv and see a different dialogue along with it yeah it's pretty cool exactly yeah <laughs> um mm -mm -mm. okay so let's talk about your live tour shows with this new album you're coming back yeah to, i believe the tour starts here is that right yeah we're we're starting it i guess it's not <laughs> much of a tour but um we wanted to play shows you know we, we yeah. felt like we sort of owed it to the record to play shows so we're going to be playing the sioux let me check the calendar september 8th at the loft um it's going to be a full band show so summer sets is going to play a set um and then we're going to play same band and we're going to play a full band like kale matson set um so play the play the hits after yeah, 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 um yeah. it'll be really nice it'll be fun i haven't played summer sets has played things festivals and stuff over the past few years COVID has like stopped a lot of that but i haven't played sort of my own solo songs in a couple of years probably like i you know focusing on this new project to sort of put that on the yeah. the back burner so it'll be a nice sort of it'll be a lot of me uh for a night but you know i guess that's what you're hopefully coming out for it'll be really fun um i think the show is going to be great and it'll be a really cool it'll be a cool night and the venue is great so yeah i'm excited i already got my ticket <laughs> great looking forward to it <laughs> um so let's briefly touch on teaching teaching at yeah <laughs> That's pretty cool, full circle for sure. Um, did you ever imagine yourself teaching, being a teacher? No, yeah. Yeah. not at all. <laughs> um, yeah, it just sort of happened. It was like, it's the most, you know, natural thing that's probably ever happened um, for me. And, you know, it, it sort of, they started really small, um, teaching a couple of music majors. And then now it's grown into a, I teach a fourth year class on songwriting, direct the singer songwriter ensemble, and I have about a dozen music majors that I. Yeah, it's cool. Like I, you know, in terms of like my career, I never really thought a whole lot ahead in terms of outside of just like, well, this tour is coming up and I'm going to make another record and I'm going to do this. And then COVID really stopped a lot of that. And then right. for everyone, especially every musician, you know, when you take away the ability to play live, which is every musician's biggest income earner. And when that's shut down, you know, I was never at a level that I was like rich or selling crazy amounts of tickets, but I made it work yeah. for, for a long time. And then something like that happens. And then, just teaching naturally came along. And I, I think if I'm like very critical or like I've like my whole career is that songwriting has always been my biggest strength. Mm -hmm. And um, that's the thing that has set me apart this whole time yeah. in my career, even from, you know, like what I was saying with, with Mark and Frank and everything, like I, that's always sort of been my thing. And then I found a Carlton's the only program in Canada university music program that, has a singer songwriter stream 
And I just like fell into it. And there wasn't the singer songwriter stream even when I was there, that didn't exist. Mm -hmm. uh, it's something that they came, that came along after. And for me, I found a way to like, I always joke that I don't really have a whole lot of skills other than like, I know how songs are put together and like, I could be like a trucker because that's like the two things I've, that's like the two things I've done for like 15 years. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, <laughs> write songs. So I, I luckily am not a trucker. Um, I, mm -hmm. I'm not a professor now, <laughs> um, but it's, it's, it's like, it's, it's like the most rewarding, fun thing. Mm -hmm. And it feels like I sort of found the thing I'm good at. Mm -hmm. um, even more so than my actual, you know, own career. It's been, it's been awesome. Um, yeah. That's beautiful. Beautiful. Is it the students? Is it the just honing in in your craft? Like what is your favorite part? I mean, students are fun. It's like, it's really awesome to see them like get better. Yeah. That's like obviously super rewarding, but I will say like, it's, also really cool to sort of synthesize like a lot of my thoughts on songwriting. Like I've been a student of like music and, and especially like songwriters for so long. I, you know, if I, my, you know, my childhood bedroom and the Sioux still has stacks of like uncut and mojo magazines, which are like British music magazines that like focus on like essentially dad rock. Like I've like, I studied those when I was like 15, 16, 17 years old. And then just also by the nature of like each one of my records has been so diverse in terms of sounds and production that, you know, I got really into pop music, really into pop music and trying to figure out how those songs were written and like, why do they work? Why are they infinitely uh, more popular like how does that happen you know i want to know how that works so i got really into that and you know my tastes have really broadened and evolved over a bunch of years and now i get to like share all of that <laughs> um and it's cool like i think for the students like they see me as someone who's a graduate of the program that they're in right. and i'm like you know 15 or whatever years younger than every professor they have mm -hmm. and I'm still doing the thing that a lot of them want to do, which is, you know, be a musician and make records and tour. And so like that part of it is just really cool that I get to like, they want to hear all the stories about like Love Island and, you know, Drake and like all that <laughs> stuff more than they're like, oh, like what's touring here? Like, and like they love that stuff more than anything. Cause they don't, I never had that either. I never had that firsthand, like, here's someone that like is doing the thing that I want to do. Can I pick their brain about it or, or learn from them, you know? And so I just try to like, don't tell them not to make all the mistakes I did. <laughs> <laughs> That's so awesome. Um, so one last, I guess, question before we ended off, what advice would you give yourself back when you were in high school at the Dunn or other artists growing up in the soup? Um, Advice to myself. Mm -hmm. I think, advice to myself, I think I would have been, um, I think it would be like to be a better band leader mm -hmm. and a better sort of boss at that stuff. I, I, I wasn't great at it. I don't think I'm naturally that type of person that, is you know a leader in a lot of ways or like it's not my natural sort of tendency and i made a lot of mistakes along the way and i you know i you know i, I maybe maybe not regrets but i think there's you know it's like anything as you you're you're young and you don't know how to do a lot of stuff and you're also you know trying to do a thing that's incredibly hard and every odd you know all the odds are stacked against you especially being from somewhere like where we're from the odds are not on with you to be a successful solo singer songwriter and make it big in the music industry those odds are not with you by any means it's a struggle and i think like if my piece of advice would be to like do a better job at sort of navigating that sort of the interpersonal things 
and um, to be smarter at um, like cutting professional relationships, smarter mm. at that stuff. Mm. I mean, there's like a saying that all relationships that either end too early or too late. And that's very true. In right. my experience, a lot of them end too late mm. um, <laughs> rather than too early. But like for advice for musicians in the Sioux, and I assume there's like tons of bands in the Sioux still, right? Like I, ju I just don't know about them. I think like the best thing you can do is to expose yourself to places outside of the Sioux. If you're gonna center yourself there, great. I mean, you can, you can make it work now, especially with technology and the internet is more possible than it was when I was coming up. It was impossible. I mean, home recording wasn't even like a real thing, right. you know? Spotify was not a thing. You had to make records like CDs and then go, like I said, door to door, <laughs> town to town, and like hopefully develop a fan base. You can do, it's almost the opposite now where you, you need a fan base already online before you go out into the real world. Mm -hmm. So, but I think exposing yourself, I'm not sure bands tour and come through the Sioux like they did when I was younger. So you need to expose yourself to that. I saw incredible musicians and really, really good shows and I opened for them and I learned from them a lot from them and stole from them, right? Like I learned how to do, why are the, what are they doing that's really working? And it, if you're not exposed to that and have those experiences in Susie Marie, I think it's really hard to grow and to get better. And the biggest, best way to get better is to leave. <laughs> if you want to come back, great, but you, you got to leave because I don't think it's happening in the same way. And that's just the nature of the music industry changing over, you know, a decade. Um, That'd be my piece of advice. And then just like be dumb and naive and sort of fearless. And like, if you really want to do it, do it when you're young and yeah. don't think about, don't literally think about anything else for 10 years of your life and maybe it'll work out. <laughs> um, yeah. That's great advice. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> well, thank you so much, everyone. Go get their tickets to go see Summer Sets and Kale um, at the Loft September 8th. Um, yeah. And yeah, thank you so much for sharing your career and more about you with our audience. That was awesome. No, no, thanks, thanks for having me. It was, it was fun to think about these things for once. Um, <laughs> yeah, it was great. Yeah, awesome. Is there anything else you want to share, talk about? No. <laughs> no, I, th I think I, I shared enough for sure. <laughs> well, I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Okay, have a good one. Yes, you too. See ya. See ya.